Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, in this video, we're gonna talk about antibiotics. And um, I know that learning antibiotics is hard. There's all these different drugs and different classes. It makes it hard to keep everything straight in your mind. And uh, when you're trying to learn something complex like this, uh, the first step to make it easier is to organize your content in one place and then break it down piece by piece. And that's what we're gonna do here in this video. I'm gonna give you an overview of all the different antibiotics so you'll have the big picture, the roadmap to get you ready for deeper dives uh, into each drug in subsequent modules. But for now, if you're ready to learn about antibiotics, let's get started. All right, so let's just start with what are antibiotics. These are drugs that are used specifically to eliminate bacteria, and there's um, two types. There's bactericidal, and uh, cidal means kill, so these ones kill the bacteria directly. Um, the other type is bacteriostatic, so they keep the bacteria static, which means they stop the bacterial growth so that the immune system can take care of the bacteria. So either way, the bacteria die. Uh, clinically, it doesn't help us that much, but for board exams, you need to know which ones are bactericidal, which ones are static. And then the next question is how do antibiotics do this? Well, they have to select targets on the bacteria that are both essential for the bacteria to survive and also selective, which means that um, they're present on bacteria cells, but not so present on our cells so that they don't harm our own cells. And there's four good targets here, uh, bacterial cell wall, bacterial cell membrane, bacterial ribosomes, and bacterial DNA, RNA. And based on these targets, this is how we come up with our different uh, classes of antibiotics. All right, so now based on those targets, we can organize all of our antibiotics into four main groups. Uh, we have this group, which are the antibiotics that destroy the bacterial cell wall. We have antibiotics that destroy the cell membrane. We have antibiotics that inhibit bacterial ribosomes. And then finally, we have antibiotics that inhibit their DNA and RNA synthesis. And so now in the rest of this video, uh, we're gonna learn about all the different antibiotics by going through each of these four categories. So let's kick it off with class one here, which is the cell wall inhibitors. All right, so um, to build a good weapon, or in this case, a good antibiotic, we have to uh, first know our enemy, which is a bacteria. So let's quickly review what a cell wall is. So um, just like our cells, bacteria also have a cell membrane, but the key difference is that their cell membrane doesn't have cholesterol. And that means that their membrane becomes less fluid, so it becomes more susceptible to getting lysed. And so to prevent all of this, um, the bacteria have built sort of like a fort around their cell membrane, and that's what this pink cell wall is right here. And it's important because it's gonna protect the cell membrane and prevent lysis. Um, and so um, there's just one bacteria, by the way, that's an exception to all of this, and that's mycoplasma. This is a common cause of walking pneumonia. This actually doesn't have a cell wall because its membrane actually has sterols in it, so uh, it doesn't need a cell wall. And the important factoid here is that since it doesn't have a cell wall, it's actually resistant to this class of cell wall inhibitors, and that's high yield. But for now, let's get back to the cell wall itself. Um, since the rest of the bacteria have it, uh, it's made up of something called peptidoglycan, and I'll explain what that is on the next slide. All right, so here's our peptidoglycan cell wall. It's also known as murine. That's the other name for it. But peptidoglycan is better um, way to name it because then you can just know that it has two parts, glycan and peptide. So the glycan means sugars or carbohydrates. So that's the backbone, which is repeating disaccharide units of NAM and NAG. As you can see, there's one right here. There's another backbone right there. And these have to connect to each other via peptide chains. Each of these peptide chains has about five amino acids that's coming off. These are like the little arms that are coming off here. And the last two residues of each of these peptide chains are dialanine. So you have diala, diala here in red, diala, diala here in red, diala, diala here in red, and so on and so forth. And this is important because in order for this cell wall to be strong, they have to be cross-linked to each other. And this cross-linking uh, happens by an enzyme called transpeptidase. It's also known as penicillin binding protein, or PBP. Um, and the way that this enzyme works is that it actually has to bind these diala, da, uh, diala residues, or I like to call them dala dala residues, and connect them to each other. And so in this way, it connects the chains to each other and makes the wall strong. So to quickly summarize, the cell wall is peptidoglycan. It's made up of a glycan backbone and peptide chains, peptide chains and with two dialanine residues. And in order for the cell wall to be effective, it has to be cross-linked. This cross-linking is mediated by transpeptidase, also known as PBP. And this PBP binds the two dialanine or the diala diala residues in order to allow for the cross-linking and the strong formation of the cell wall. All right, so now that we know how the bacterial cell wall works and what the components are, let's learn about how the cell wall inhibitors work. There's three main classes. We have beta-lactams, glycopeptides, and epoxides, and let's go through each of them real quick. So the way that beta-lactams work is that they're made up of this beta-lactam ring. That's why they're called beta-lactams. And this beta-lactam ring actually mimics the diala diala residues. So what it does is it kind of fools penicillin binding protein or transpeptidase and binds to it irreversibly and basically knocks it out. And by doing so, now PBP can't do its job, so there's no cross-linking, so the wall becomes weakened and the bacteria lice. And there are four major classes of antibiotics here. You have penicillins, cephalosporins, 
monobactams and carbapenems. Uh, penicillin was the OG antibiotic that was first discovered. Um, it's a beta-lactam. And if you know that, then you can remember that carbapenem falls in the same category because it has pen in it because it's a derivative of penicillin. And then monobactam, you can also kind of remember that it's in this category because bactam sounds like beta-lactam. So good way to remember some of these. The next category is glycopeptides, and these work slightly differently. So instead of mimicking diala diala, these guys actually bind to diala diala, and they inhibit its interaction with PBP, and they also um, kind of get in the way of the glycan backbone growing. And so in this way, they're going to, again, weaken the cell wall, cause bacteria to lice. And the main antibiotics in this category are vancomycin, uh, which we give systemically, and then bacitracin, which is a topical antibiotic. And then the third um, drug in this category, these are called epoxides, and these work differently. They don't do anything uh, with the peptide chain. They actually inhibit NAM synthesis, so inhibit the synthesis of one of these two um, disaccharides in the glycan backbone, and in doing so, again, they're going to prevent the formation of the cell wall, and in the same way, they're going to cause bacterial lysis and death, and the main antibiotic in this category is phosphomycin. All right, so getting back to our antibiotic uh, drug classes overview, uh, we covered the cell wall inhibitors, which are the beta-lactams, which are the penicillins, cephalosporins, monobactams, and carbapenem. We covered the glycopeptides, which are vanco and bacitracin, covered epoxides. So now let's move on to our next category, which are the cell membrane disruptors. All right, so now we've moved in from the kind of outer fortress of the cell wall into the cell membrane itself of the bacteria, and there's two main drug classes here. Um, we have the lipopeptides, and the way that these guys work is that um, they get into the cell membrane of the bacteria and they stick ion channels in there. They cause shifting of ions back and forth. They're going to depolarize uh, the membrane of the bacteria and essentially lead to loss of function of everything and bacterial cell death. And what's important about uh, these ones to recognize is that they're mostly active against gram-positive bacteria, uh, bacteria, and we usually reserve them to treat the highly resistant ones, which are MRSA. And the main drug here is daptomycin. So key takeaway here is that lipopeptides are mostly effective against gram-positive bacteria. And then on the other hand, we have polymyxins. Once again, they're going to get into the cell membrane of the bacteria and bind phospholipids. They're going to mess up the integrity of the cell membrane and again, cause lysis and death of the bacteria. But the key difference is that these are more effective against gram-negative bacteria. And again, we usually reserve these for the highly resistant or what we call multi-drug resistant bacteria. So key distinction is lipopeptides against gram-positives, polymyxins against gram-negatives. And for polymyxins, there's two main drugs here. We have polymyxin E, otherwise known as colistin. This is systemic. And then polymyxin B, which is given topically as part of medications like neosporin and polysporin. And just generally speaking, um, cell membrane inhibitors are less selective for bacterial cells over our cells. And that should make sense, right? Because our cells also have a cell membrane. And this is one of the reasons why we only reserve this, uh, uh, these antibiotics for, um, for bacteria that are resistant to all the other classes. Okay, so we talked about cell wall and cell membrane inhibitors. Now let's go inside the bacteria and look at our targets there. So let's move on to the next category, which are the ribosome inhibitors. So again, let's learn a little bit about our enemy. The reason that we can target bacterial ribosomes is that because their ribosomes are different than our ribosomes. So the eukaryotic ribosome, which is our cells, has a 60S and 40S subunit, whereas the bacterial ribosome has a 50S and 30S subunit, as shown right here. And therefore, since their ribosomes are different than ours, then these are gonna make a good target for antibiotics. And so we have two different kind of classes of antibiotics that fall in this category, those that target 30S and those that target 50S. So we're gonna learn about each of those now. Yeah. All right, so let's start off with the 30S inhibitors, and there's three um, antibiotic classes that fall in this category. First one are the tetracyclines. The main drugs here are doxycycline, tetracycline, and minocycline. So the first thing to know is that they all end with cycline. Good way to remember that. And the mechanism here is that these drugs are going to bind the 30S subunit and prevent the attachment of the amino acid tRNA to the uh, acceptor site. Um, next category are tigacyclines, and these are just derivatives of tetracycline, so they work in a very similar way. And the reason they're sometimes used is that because they're more effective against some resistant bacteria. And then the third drug category here are the aminoglycosides, so they work differently. So you have gentamicin, tobramycin, and streptomycin, and they have uh, a couple of different mechanisms. So number one, they block the initiation complex. They also block translocation, and they can cause um, codon misreading, which is going to cause uh, abnormal proteins to be made, which can cause the bacteria to die. 
A couple of important things to know about the aminoglycosides is that um, they actually require oxygen for uptake. So I think of amine O glycosides because they need O or oxygen for uptake. So that means that they're only effective against aerobic bacteria. So that's high yield. The other high yield thing is that their binding um, to the ribosome is irreversible. They're actually bactericidal. Uh, and that's in contrast to all the other ribosome inhibitors that are primarily bacteriostatic. So the high yield things for aminoglycosides to know is that they're only effective against aerobic bacteria their binding is irreversible, and they're bactericidal. All right, so now let's learn about the 50S inhibitors, and there's four uh, drug classes here. First two are the macrolides and clindamycin, and they both inhibit translocation. Uh, two most common macrolides that are used are azithromycin, which is often prescribed as something called z pack for treatment of um, bacterial bronchitis or atypical pneumonia, and then erythromycin, which is an uh, eye ointment that's usually given for conjunctivitis. Clindamycin is commonly used for infection caused by anaerobic bacteria uh, when these infections occur above the diaphragm. So, for example, inside the mouth or in the lungs, and that's because uh, clindamycin has good tissue penetration there and is particularly effective against those bacteria. So that's important to know for anaerobic infections above the diaphragm. Uh, linazolid is the third uh, drug class here in this category, and this one works differently. It inhibits the formation of the initiation complex. And one important side effect to know about linazolid is that it can cause something called serotonin syndrome if taken concurrently with um, other medications like SSRIs uh, can lead to elevated levels of serotonin. Um, and so that's an important side effect of linazolid. And then finally, the fourth drug in this category is chloramphenicol. And this one works by inhibiting the enzyme peptidyl transferase. And chloramphenicol is very rarely used. I have never um, seen it in my clinical practice, but it does show up at USMLE hospital. So you need to know it. And the reason for all of that is that because it has severe, severe side effects, uh, it can cause aplastic anemia. And then it can also cause something called gray baby syndrome, which is basically in infants and newborns. It can cause cardiovascular collapse, which causes their skin to become cyanotic and kind of ashen gray and blue. And that's where the name came from. That's why this is very, uh, very rarely used, but you need to know it for board exams and you need to know these side effects. So these are the four main uh, drug classes that are 50S inhibitors. All right, so here's a quick recap of all the ribosome inhibitors. So we have the 30S inhibitors down here. We have the tetracyclines, and they uh, work by inhibiting the uh, binding of amino acid tRNA to the acceptor site. And then you have the aminoglycosides, and they uh, have a couple of different mechanisms. They inhibit the initiation complex, they inhibit translocation, and they cause misreading of codons. And then up here, you have the four drugs that are the 50S inhibitors. So we have macrolides and clindamycin that inhibit translocation. We have linazolid that inhibits formation of the initiation complex. Then you have chloramphenicol that inhibits the enzyme peptidyl transferase. And um, one more thing is that um, these are all bacteriostatic, except aminoglycosides, as I mentioned earlier, are bactericidal. All right, so let's move on to the final category here, which is the antibiotic that's disrupt uh, bacterial DNA and RNA, and there's four uh, main classes here. So the first ones work by inhibiting bacterial folate, and so these are known as the antifolate antibiotics. The main drugs here are sulfonamides, dapsone, and trimethoprim, and by inhibiting bacterial folate, they're going to decrease the synthesis of nucleotides and DNA, which is going to cause bacterial death. The second category here are the fluoroquinolones, and all of these end with floxacin, um, so cipro, levo, O, and moxifloxacin. And the way that these guys work is that they inhibit two enzymes, bacterial DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4. This is going to lead to formation of DNA breaks, and uh, this is how it's going to cause bacterial death. And one important side effect of the quinolones that's very high yield is that they can cause a tendon injury and tendon rupture. The third drug class here is metronidazole. Uh, this medication is also known as flagyl. Um, and the way that this works is that it creates a uh, toxic metabolite that's a free radical, which is going to damage bacterial DNA, and it's going to cause bacterial cell death. And a uh, high yield about metronidazole is that it can also be used to treat anaerobic infections, just like we saw with clindamycin, except the difference here is that this is for infections that are below the diaphragm, so primarily in the gastrointestinal tract or in the uh, genital urinary tract. And the reason for this is that anaerobes that are in this particular part of the body are more susceptible to metronidazole. And also metronidazole has better tissue penetration there. So the key difference between clinda and metronidazole is that clindamycin is used for anaerobes above the diaphragm, whereas metronidazole is used for anaerobes below the diaphragm. And one other important um, fact to keep in mind about metronidazole is that it can actually cause a side effect known as a disulfiram-like reaction with ethanol. So this is why metronidazole is not supposed to be um, mixed with alcohol. So you you should uh, advise the patients not to drink alcohol if they're taking this antibiotic.
And then the final drug here in this category is called rifampin. And the way that this one works slightly different than the rest of them is that it's the only one that specifically inhibits bacterial RNA synthesis. And um, one important kind of high yield side effect about rifampin that you have to warn people about is that it can cause a harmless uh, discoloration of body fluids like urine. It'll turn them red and orange. You just want to give them a heads up so that they're not worried when they see it. All right, so let's recap everything that we just learned. Our antibiotics can be broken down into four different classes. We have the cell wall inhibitors, which are beta-lactams, which are penicillins, cephalosporins, monobactams, and carbapenem, glycopeptides, which are vancomycin and bacitracin, and then epoxides. Then the next category are the cell membrane disruptors, which are adaptomycin and polymyxin. Then we have the ribosome inhibitors, which are the 30S ones, which are tetracycline, tigacycline, which is a derivative, and aminoglycosides and then the uh, 450S inhibitors, which are uh, macrolides, uh, clindamycin, chloramphenicol, and linazolid. And then the final category was the ones that disrupt bacterial DNA and RNA, which are the antifolates, fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, and rifampin. A couple of final points I want to make here is that these antibiotics are non-mycobacterium. That means they're not effective against mycobacterium. Mycobacterium is dif different than mycoplasma that I talked about earlier. Mycoplasma was the thing I talked about in the beginning with cell wall inhibitors that causes mycoplasma pneumonia. And uh, lots of these antibiotics are effective against mycoplasma. The only thing that's not effective against it really is the cell wall inhibitors. But Mycobacterium causes tuberculosis and leprosy. This is completely different than mycoplasma, and uh, this is a highly resistant bacteria. And so most of these antibiotics have no effect against mycobacterium. Really the only one from everything we talked about that works against mycobacterium is rifampin. So for mycobacterium, there's an entire regimen called RIPE therapy, which stands for rifampin, isoniazide, um, and a couple of other drugs that I'll talk about in a separate video. But the main point I want to drive home here is that these antibiotics are common against pretty much all bacteria except for mycobacterium, which has its own set of antibiotics that I'll cover in a different video. All right, that's it and that's all. If you want to learn more about this topic, you can check out the other videos that I'm going to link here. And if you guys enjoyed this one, please don't forget to like, comment, share it with others, and subscribe so that you don't miss out on more content. But for now, thanks for watching. I will see you next time.